Uh, usually down south, I'm from Tennessee, uh, usually down south we have to do that twice. Um, so this is my second time uh, preaching on Sunday morning, so um, sorry I'm not as polished as most people. Um, so I'll go ahead and apologize for that. Um, but I want to give you guys a little backstory about myself. So I grew up in Atlanta, well I was born in Atlanta, we moved to Alabama for a year and then I've been in Knoxville, Tennessee since I was about three and a half. Um, I'm from the Carnes Church of Christ Congregation. Um, I have been blessed to, to grow up there. We have a school of preaching there. We have about 350 members. Um, so hopefully I have been grown up in the scriptures enough to be led by God to share something that is according to his will. Um, so today I have an option for you all. Um, we can either go with a lesson on Isaiah um, and talk about his relationship with God or we can talk about spirit and in truth and go about it in an interesting way. What do you guys think? Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth, because I did hear a little bit of a conversation by you and this Robin earlier. So we are going to scratch everything that I had prepared. <laughs> and we are going to go with John 4. Let's turn to John 4. I know Seth did ask for me to do it on Isaiah because I am doing a reverse uh, lesson next week at church camp. Uh, on Isaiah, and he was like, you can get a little bit of practice in, and I can't do the same lesson twice, so I'm glad you guys picked Spirit and Truth. <clears throat> so John 4, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the woman at the well so we can get some backstory there, because I love context. Context, um, throughout all of scripture, helps us understand how every word is true and how everything correlates and how it is perfect. So in John 4 here, I, I know a lot of us have probably heard this story many times uh, when we were younger or when we were babes in Christ. Uh, but just picture this, um, this woman who um, has so many different husbands and Jesus calls her out not to be like, you sinner, you sinner, you sinner, I hate you because Jesus obviously loves her. Um, he's telling her that he knows about her whole life story. So she then eventually says at the end of this chapter, you know, guys, look, this is a guy who's told me everything I ever knew and he didn't literally tell her that um, but the fact that he knows that proving that he is the Christ that he's the Messiah um, but I'm, I don't know if you guys have heard this or not you, you could have uh, maybe Seth has talked about this before um, but the Jews were probably really confused especially the 12 um, the, the disciples of Christ that, that were really confused probably when they were going through Samaria instead of going around Samaria because the Jews hated the Samaritans and the Samaritan woman, obviously being a half Jew, um, one Gentile parent, one Jewish parent, and they moved to this area because they were persecuted by the Jews and they weren't quite Gentile enough to be a Gentile. So they were just like, I guess we're Samaritans. Um, and being in this area, the Jews would travel around Samaria because they were frankly racist. Um, and they were like, well, you're not purely Gentile, so we don't hate you, but we do hate you because you're not purely Jew. Um, and Jesus, of course, flips the world upside down. It's like, let's just go straight through it. And goes to the well and finds this woman at the well as his disciples are gone uh, into town. Um, and so I love how this, this setup is because a lot of times we just immediately go to John 4 verses 23 uh, and 24. And we usually just read one of them, but we're going to read both of them here in a moment. But the great thing um, about this passage is to remember that this woman is asking the question of Christ, saying, we worship on this mountain, and you Jews worship in Jerusalem, so what's the right thing? So keep in mind here, what she's asking is, where's the place of worship? And what we get as Christians is what Jesus is about to answer her. And so this, this great thing that we're going to read, we're going to get even more backstory. Let's go to uh, verse 21. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship that what excuse me, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is for, of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, 
and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So we read that passage a lot, but now with that backstory, we understand that she is now excited that she gets to worship wherever. It doesn't matter. And we have that avenue today that we get to worship wherever we want, as long as we assemble as the church, as the saints, which we are doing today, which is honorable in the sight of God. <clears throat> but let's think about it culturally to us as well. Let's flip over to Romans 10. And uh, I heard there was a time crunch. I promise you I don't really speak more than 15 minutes. I don't like to speak more than 15 minutes. I'm short and sweet, try to get to the point. But let's talk about our society for a moment. And we're going to go to Romans 10, and then we're going to go over to Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to correlate these two things together, and then the lesson will be yours. I'll say the famous southern phrase of the lesson will be yours. I don't usually say that, so there's a treat for y'all today. <clears throat> Romans 10 verse 2. We'll read verse 1 as well. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Okay? <clears throat> we read this passage. We're going to flip over to Re Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to correlate them with John 4. Revelation chapter 2. This is my favorite story uh, of one of the churches because throughout all of scripture or excuse me yes revelation revelation does kind of sum up for us the story of the church of ephesus starting in acts 18 and 19 with apollos uh there and then for some of the take him to the side and they're like hey dude this isn't the right <laughs> you're not teaching the right thing here and then paul comes in and it's like who are you guys baptized into and they're like uh john's baptism uh, do you have the holy spirit uh, what's that and he's like, all right, let me tell you about Jesus, and then they all get baptized, right? Uh, so that's the start of Ephesus, and then Paul gets thrown out of Ephesus because they have a riot because the, silver, the silversmiths are there. Silversmith. The silversmiths are there, and they are mad because their trade is ruined because they're all idolaters. And then you see the book of Ephesus talking about unity again, and then now we have Revelation chapter 2, which they lost their first love. We'll read about that right now. <laughs> Revelation chapter 2 verse 1 reads To the angel of the church of Ephesus write These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand Who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands I know your works, your labor, your patience And that you cannot bear those who are evil And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars, and you have preserved, and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So this passage and Romans 10, too, correlating it with spirit and in truth. I think you guys know where I'm going with this. Spirit and truth, when we come to worship God, truth, we obviously always go back to, yeah, the, the word of God is truth. Spirit, we also need to think about the heart that we have when we come to worship God. The reverence, the respect, the love. Also, fellowshipping with one another, that's something that's also commanded. Talking with one another, we are to love one another in those ways and do good works in that way. <clears throat> so, to correlate these things... Uh, has been a, I'm, I'm from Freed Hardeman. That's where I just graduated from, uh, Church Christ School. And it took me five years. So it was a long time coming. Um, but I've been blessed to be there because I've seen a lot of this spirit and truth problem that we see in the world today. That a lot of times we have a right or a left issue. And so Romans 10 telling us, you know, they, they have a love for God. They have that spirit don't have the truth they don't have the knowledge 
But then you have the flip side here where they know exactly what the truth is and they're doing those good works, but they're just sitting in their pews. They don't have that love. And so Jesus is telling us in John 4 to worship in spirit and in truth. It's not a 50-50 thing. It's not a 75-25. It's 100% and 100%. And so this is something that me and Ms. Robin were actually talking about on the way here, which, again, you talking to her about it, and then you saying now that you want to have a lesson on this. This is what you guys wanted to speak one of you speak on I guess today and this is what the word of God is going to tell you <clears throat> a beautiful man named Jesus telling us to worship in spirit and truth if we sit there and have 75% spirit and 100% truth we're still doing it wrong amen, amen. and then vice versa if you have 100% spirit and 75% truth you're still worshiping wrong amen, amen. <clears throat> so societally Talking about Jesus, how he worked in his ministry for three years. One of the great examples of a left-right opposition we have is the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? And so the Pharisees are on this, let's, let's go with the right and the left, because we like to do that in our society today. Um, but we have the Pharisees who are on the right who are legalistic, and we say that all the time. They built a hedge around the word of God. So it's like, don't touch this hedge. Because if you get over the hedge, then you're really, really sitting. But I'm better than you because I'm a Pharisee, and I don't even get close to the hedge. And then you have the Sadducees who are like, I don't even believe in the resurrection. And a lot of times we like to say progressive or left. We're going to put them over here. And who's in the middle? Jesus. He steps on everyone's toes, just like he does to us. He steps on our toes, but more importantly, he steps on our hearts. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees didn't always get it. Just like the world. Sometimes we may have this truth, but we are not showing that love to people. And we're like, these people are wrong. These people are wrong. These people are wrong. Yeah, and it's funny that y'all mentioned it. House to House, Heart to Heart, is that what it's called? Uh, we actually did a campaign last year mm -hmm. at my home congregation in Knoxville. Um, and, you know, door knocking is a great thing. Um, relationship evangelism is a great thing. And what Paul says, if I, if, I, if I speak in tongues, if I have all these spiritual gifts, if I do all these things, which we know those things are passed away, but if I have all these things and I don't have love, none of it matters because I haven't become all things to all men. I haven't done the right thing. And they're not going to understand spirit and truth. They're only going to hear the truth. They're not going to understand the love of God. Now, if you flip it and you do the opposite, you only have spirit you have no truth what's it worth nothing you speak on faith hope and love that's something that we have a huge problem with in a lot of our denominational friends I'm going to say friends because they are our friends because we hope that they see the truth but we have to come to them in love but they speak on these things like faith hope and love all the time that's great you got some milk man where's that food coming in and then another thing that me and Ms. Robin talked about today is in Hebrews chapter 6, those elementary principles. Why are we still arguing about those things? It's because people aren't looking at spirit and truth. So, with that real world example of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you can say Republican, Democrat, if you want. I don't care. You can say left, right. I don't even say liberal. I don't really say conservative because I think they're stupid to put I those things up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they are. <laughs> You can say regressive if you want. You can say progressive, left, right, whatever. Jesus is the middle, and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to the Father except through him. Amen. And we're just going to go back to what Paul says. We need to become all things to all men. So if you, as a congregation, as a body in Christ, if we are all struggling with the same thing, and struggle actually means to contend against, if it's something that you are working through, if that is one of those of spirit and truth, where you have the truth, but it's hard for us to have spirit, we need to repent of that. <laughs> we need to have more love for one another. If it's the vice versa, uh, usually the churches of Christ, we tend to veer more on the truth side out of that 100, 100%. If we're lacking on one, it's not having more of one or the other. It's having a lack of one. Um, <clears throat> and our denominational friends, they are also lacking in one area or the other. We just 
reteach those elementary principles to one another and edify one another to then go out and use something like house to house, heart to heart. We're looking in scripture and seeing how these different preachers of God's word reach other people by using their personalities, using their charisma. That we are allowed to use our charisma in the way that we speak. It doesn't matter if you're 80 years, or, years old, it doesn't matter if you're 40, it doesn't matter if you're 23. Uh, I'm very young, but I'm gonna do whatever I can. I encourage everyone here to do whatever you can to worship the spirit and truth and bring that to others. And again, like Paul says, we need to become all things of all men, so we need to be weak to maybe save some, but hopefully save many. Uh, so if you need anything today, uh, if you are not worshiping in spirit and in truth, you need to repent of that. Uh, and if you're not a Christian and you want to start your journey in submission to Christ, come forward as we stand and as we sing. Of course, it's <laughs>